This is a conversation with Scott Wiener. He's the founder of the very popular Scott's Pizza Tours in New York City, a columnist at Pizza Today, and the holder of a Guinness World Record for the most unique pizza box collection. He's also the founder of Slice Out Hunger, a nonprofit dedicated towards hunger relief. In this conversation, we discuss the connections between pizza and the history of a place, what pizza tells us about the culture of that place, what it tells us about ourselves, and we also dissect another New York City icon, the bagel. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, or rate five stars on Apple Podcasts. These episodes are not easy to make, not cheap as well. So if you'd like to support this channel, do consider making a donation on Patreon or on Anchor. If not through monetary channels, then do consider sharing these episodes, liking and commenting. Your engagement goes a long way. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram or Twitter or follow me personally. And now, it is no time. In the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Sean Penn orders a box of pizza in a history class as an act of rebellion. However, in your work, in your tours, in your book, in your videos, pizza and history have been married together in an act of love. You've often implied that to really understand the New York style slice, to really understand Lombardi's pizza, you need to know the history of Soho of the early 20th century. You need to know about the factories, the factory workers, you need to know about the Italian immigrants. You need to know a lot of economical factors about the availability of fuel, cheese, dough, ovens, machinery in the kitchen as well. And you need to also know the railway tracks and the coal mines around it. So my first question for you is, how close is the link between the history of New York City and the history of pizza itself. Do you think a good pizza historian is inevitably going to be a good historian of the city in general? You cannot separate a city from its food. And it, not just pizza, any food. But pizza in particular is totally, the pizza that New Yorkers eat is a product of this city. And when you talk about Pizza being an Italian food or the pizza that you had once when you were visiting some, I don't know, maybe you were in Colombia or you were in France, it, that pizza will naturally reflect the place where it is. Unless it's a place that's trying to reflect another city. So the beauty of New York is that we have pizzerias that are Neapolitan style and Detroit style, but the one that people want to eat when they come here is that New York style pizza, which like, like even just... Thinking about that phrase, what, what is New York style pizza to you? The questions back on me. This is not how it works. What is it? <laughs> no, I mean, I just want to know. I ask the questions, but. To you, what, when question. I say New York style pizza, close your eyes. Close your eyes. The, I don't need to close that. I know exactly <laughs> what, it, what it sounds like. It would either be the Joe's Pizza on Times Square, the Spider-Man one, and Two Bros. Yes. Okay. So both of those things are a slice on a paper plate. The slice is larger than the paper plate, and they're both. Neither of them have chairs. They're all stand-up, right? So when you're talking about and asking about the combination of a city and the pizza, I mean, New York-style pizza was formed by the city itself. It's a pedestrian city. You got to eat while you're walking. You get, it's quick. And New York's pizza shops, like the slice shops, don't have TVs, don't have Wi-Fi. It's it's not a place to hang. It's a it's a it's quick, and that's because New Yorkers are quick. I do want to explore this further, and this ties in with something Anthony Bourdain had uh, spoken about when he was talking about the New York style pizza. When he said maybe it's not the best pizza in the world, but it's an experience. It's a unique, universal, working class experience. Before we dive into New York, though, I just want to touch upon this marriage of history and pizza in all your work. When I was going through your work, I found that I was able to retain a lot more information than I would compared to a conventional history class or a book or a video. And that's got a lot to do with the way you present the information. It's very engaging. It's a mixture of humor and information, the perfect blend. And also I think you're so passionate about your work that it completely seeps through. But I also try to dissect it even further. And I found that, at least for me, one of the reasons why I'm so engaged with your content is because the central theme is there's a fun anchor around pizza, which has got this massive positive connotation for me. I love pizza. It's a great topic. 
and using that you can then slide in so much information about things that normally i might not take that much interest in if someone tells me about the railway routes to brooklyn i might probably not pay that much attention or the phone book or certificates licenses difference between canned tomatoes you know availability of fuel or in terms of wood or coal and what makes a difference where a brick was forged in a particular oven so i found that a very very interesting way of presenting the information the question that arises from this is in a way it's a chicken or egg question do you think in your heart you're more of a history buff or a history nerd in general and pizza just happened to be the right front of the facade this fun anchor that allowed you to explore your love for history or do you think your love for pizza takes center stage and the interest in his origin story came afterwards so for me personally it's pizza first absolutely and i definitely have a love for history but i didn't discover that until i got to pizza So when I started running pizza tours in 2008, at that time I was living on an old historic ferry boat. The Yankee. Yeah, the, the Yankee. Yankee ferry. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh no, what else do you know? But uh, you know, like You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, right? But yeah. living on that boat was something that I didn't seek it out because I loved the history or boats or anything. It was a place where I could live for free and I lucked into a situation where I could work on the boat in exchange for living on it for free. and then i fell in love with the history of it and i learned that oh this boat was built in 1907 in philadelphia and walking around the boat we figured out that oh this piece is from the original boat this was added in 1918 when it was commissioned by the us military as a military boat this was added during world war 2 you know and i would start to give people tours about the layers of the boat and you don't have to care anything about a boat to to be intrigued by Oh, what is this piece there for? You know, because I don't really care about boats. I don't. But I care about knowing that there was something going on. And to me, when I got to pizza, I love pizza because I love to eat it. But then that love of what's going on in the background, like the why does this happen the way it happens? That all came out. It kind of shook out because of it. Because I think when I was trying to teach people about pizza, I knew that I the tour cannot just be taking people to a place feeding them food and then saying oh isn't it great let's take a picture of it there's there's nothing to it if you don't understand the background so that's why to me it became i you know I, i got into doing pizza tours when there were a lot of lists coming out there still are but at that time it was kind of novel oh 10 most historic pizzerias 10 whatever and i wanted to understand more about why is this one different from this one Joe's and John's you just confused Joe's and John's. I wanted to know, well what makes John's different from Joe's? And the answer is to to the person who doesn't know the background, the answer is, oh, well this one's only sold by the slice and this one's only by the whole pie. But if you turn it back and say, well this one opened at a time period where there was no natural gas infrastructure, coal was the cheapest fuel source, that's why they do that. To me that's the interesting thing because we could argue all day about what pizza is better and it's subjective which means that we're both right and we're both wrong depending on who you are no you're definitely right <laughs> no, no, no no but you know what i mean like on a tour you can't argue you can't and you can't teach somebody i never wanted to be oh we're in new york you got to love our pizza it's the best you can ever go home you have to eat your all your pizza your whole life eat it here i wanted it to be more about let's understand the objective information what's the science what's the history the stuff you can't debate and and that's why like the the love of history and science and everything was an afterthought but it's what it's become the more important piece of the puzzle i kind of tell people on tours i don't really care which one you like the most i don't care if you like all of them but i care that you understand that they come out the way they do for reasons and those reasons are political economic scientific i mean there's it it's totally flipped backwards for me it started as pizza first for me and now it's it's more about the bones than it is the skin now 14 years later i completely agree with and i just it's hard this might not make sense but it just it just makes that whole experience a lot more richer even though they're making the pizza the exact same way but to know the story behind it suddenly there's i don't know there's context to it it shouldn't change the flavor profile but for me then this that slice means something more 
of course they're not do adding anything to it just by knowing the story nothing changes but there is there is an element for sure let's okay i took a digression let's go back to what you were talking about originally you were talking about the culture of a city the history of a city how that can be explained completely through pizza i have a game segment for you so yeah drum roll time i hope you came prepared i'm always prepared up. always prepared love that energy let's do it so you were describing the manhattan style which is more of a slice culture you people are always on the move the pizza joins you on the path you take it's often on a paper plate or even not even that people just eat it on the hand in contrast to something like jersey where you grew up it's more of a driving culture you go somewhere get a box come back and that kind of reflects the driving culture that's there in jersey itself i'm going to extend this link now to various different cities i'm going to list down in a minute or less i would like you to tell me what the pizza eating experience tells us about the culture of the city itself are you ready yeah let's go first one brooklyn so brooklyn and manhattan it's the same thing there's no difference done <laughs> short enough don't people say that brooklyn is where the real pizza is at people, people say that but i the only difference is when you're in a place with more turnover and more of a transient nature like manhattan then you're going to get fewer places that are really old and storied so when you go into queens or into brooklyn you're more likely to find the untouched places that are deeper in but there's no intrinsic difference between their styles let's put that debate to the rest next one bronx the bronx is a little different than most and to generalize about the style of pizza there it does tend to be on the larger side of things but i do find that some of those places on average tend to be on the undercooked over cheese side of things. So the best places in the Bronx do not have much of a common thread. I'm thinking about Louis and Ernie's, I'm thinking about Mario's on Arthur Avenue. They're not I we really try to lump things together and say that oh, well the Bronx is one borough, so they must have something that's more cohesive and the truth is that that's not the case. And there's not much about it that makes it so different from Queens. we try to draw these lines it's like talking about europe and trying to differentiate poland and russia and germany and depending on what year it is the borders in a different spot so i i think that in new york people try to have a battle of boroughs yeah. but really the biggest differences are when you're more separated staten island is more different from the rest of the boroughs than What's any the of the other four What? because staten island is so separated yeah. you're only getting there via car or a boat there's no subway that will take you there So you're getting more drivers. There's only one train line that goes through Staten Island. So that's more like New Jersey style where you're getting a whole pizza and it's not so much a by the slice culture. The other b- four boroughs are all by the slice culture. Next one, Trenton. Trenton, New Jersey does not have a pizza culture anymore. The pizzerias of Trenton have all moved to Robbinsville, but Trenton began as much in the same way that New York City did as a industrial city that attracted southern italian immigrants funny enough some of the earliest pizzerias maybe the earliest pizzeria in new jersey was founded by somebody who used to own the pizzeria that is now called lombardis so there's a direct connection but the difference in trenton is that they're doing a rough crushed tomato the tomatoes on top of the cheese and they'll refer to it as tomato pie even though same thing as pizza the pizza that you get in Trenton or in Robbinsville really it i believe is more like the first pizzerias that opened in New York than the current oldest pizzerias in New York ooh because when wow. something leaves its home it preserves its own culture as a defensive mechanism just like immigrants from any country who land in another tend to hold on to the culture of their country at the time that they left it and then you go back to that country 20 years later and that country has moved on and you have not so it's really interesting that's why i believe trenton has some of that that holds on more tightly it's a nice observation next one new haven i'm going there next week new haven and trenton offer a very similar product same idea but and it's for the same reason is that new haven was an industrial city and that industrial city attracted southern italian immigrants but it tends to not be a slice a, a by the slice community and it's because the older places with the old coal ovens where you can't do by the slice have stayed around since the 20s and 30s so it's a reflection of that city as we've lost the italian neighborhood 
as it's shrunk, the places that remain hold on tightly to their heritage and they have become museums and attracting people to come and visit them to see a glimpse of the past, not necessarily to see what's happening today. A glimpse of the past. I love it. A lot of common threads in the one so far. Let's change it up a bit. What does the Chicago style pizza tell us about Chicago? Define Chicago style pizza. The deep dish. So you say that, but there's way more thin crust pizza eaten in Chicago than deep dish. And most Chicagoans eat deep dish very rarely, only when people are visiting from out of town. Deep dish did not become a popular thing until the 70s. It's very recent, but it's more famous because it's so obviously different from New York style. And New York style is sort of like this big champion of pizza. Uh, and Chicago deep dish is a little different, but its reflection on its home of just deep dish shows how Chicago is the opposite type of city from New York. It's not a pedestrian town. It's cold. And people want to sit inside, have a couple of beers, and they're happy to wait the 40 minutes for the deep dish pizza to bake. It's not a by-the-slice culture at all. So this, the reason that New York slice shops don't work well in Chicago is the same reason that deep dish pizzerias don't work in New York. Because they're different cultural cities. That's it. New Yorkers don't want to wait. That is a great observation. Detroit. Detroit has only really become known for their pizza over the past 20 years. And really, it's been, on, it's been more like 10 years. But the first reference to Detroit as its own style that I've found is from a 1984 article about a pizzeria that was opening in Galveston, Texas. And it was a Detroit native who moved to Galveston, Texas and said, I'm bringing Detroit-style Sicilian pizza to Texas. Because the only time, or the first time, that something is referenced as its own style, a regional style, is when it's reported from outside that region. Nobody in Detroit ever called it that. Nobody in New York ever called it New York-style pizza until somebody else told them that what they do is different. It's New York-style. So that's why Detroit-style is such a reflection of its city. Detroit is the motor city. The pans that they bake, that square pizza that Detroit's become famous for, are allegedly the same type of pans that were used by the auto industry as drip pans and as uh, tool storage and hardware cleaning pans. So it's so beautiful that that style of pizza tells the story of the city, but we can't disconnect it from being a Sicilian focaccia that just happens to be made in a different pan and therefore has undergone a transformation that gives it a new identity. Controversy. I don't want people from Detroit. No, uh, they know that this in. is true. <laughs> what I'm saying is we, as humans, we want to believe that there's lines around something. We like to box things in because the universe is complicated and we don't know why we're here and why we have consciousness and how does it even make sense? Are we the only ones? And I know we're talking about pizza, but it's all relevant because we want to say that Detroit style is this thing. But really, if you look at the history of that style, the person who's credited with starting it was making his mother-in-law's Sicilian focaccia recipe in this thicker pan. And that leads to uh, more cheese, putting the cheese all the way to the edge, and blah, 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 which makes a whole new style. But styles don't just come out of nowhere. They always have that background. And when you take the pan of Detroit and make that the home of the Sicilian Sfingione, a new thing is born. I'm sorry, that was over a minute. It was minus five points. Yeah, damn it. Yeah, it's, that's uh, here. Minus five. But, but we appreciate it because you've also ended up dissing Detroit side piece. I'm only joking. No way. I'm sure you'll end up dissing the next one as well. <laughs> so the next one is California. California is a state. You've given me yeah, all cities. I've given you Californian style pizza. No, California style pizza is something that's become popular lately, yeah. but people are calling it other things, which is just using fresh local produce and not sticking to some kind of a traditional Italian origin. And so since California is such a sweet spot for produce, it makes perfect sense that that's where this Alice Waters really is a pioneer of it. Use great ingredients and don't get in their way. That's the concept. And that makes sense in California. 
And it's a little more baffling to somebody in New York who's used to tomato, mozzarella, put it in the oven. I see. Yeah, I do see it. Last one, another state, the Hawaiian style pizza. Really fascinating because the name Hawaiian style and the use of pineapple on the pizza, which is really the central focus of Hawaiian pizza, <laughs> are neither of them starting in Hawaii. They're all they're all using the word Hawaii to reference this unique nature of this food that you don't assume Hawaii and pizza. So pineapple is that Hawaiian connection. Let me guess the a guy plant. in Texas started this again. No. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> you know what the earliest historical reference to pineapple on pizza or the use of the word Hawaiian, I think was in Chicago, 1953. Then there's evidence of- 1953? Yeah. Dang. Portland, Oregon, 1957. And then the story that everybody who's watching this is going to angrily comment, well, Wikipedia told me <laughs> that it was invented in Canada. That was in 1962. And while that person, um, his name's Sam Pompalos, I believe, while he probably didn't know about prior uses, he is credited with creating that style. But Hawaiian pizza is, this is what's amazing about it. Mainland United States vision of Hawaii, especially at that time, was this. I mean, it's the most isolated place on earth. Distant, tropical. I mean, growing up, Hawaiian vacation, that phrase seemed to me like the most, that's the highest level of existence, <laughs> being able to go on a vacation to Hawaii. Yeah. Seriously. And it yeah. never went as a kid, ever. But Hawaiian pizza is mainland U.S.'s way of thinking about this exotic tropical thing. And it's all fantasy because in Hawaii, Hawaiian pizza doesn't really exist. It doesn't exist. And when it does exist, there are other things that are way more Hawaiian than pineapple and ham together. But it's the suburban New Jersey or Seattle, Washington or whatever view of what is exotic. It's really interesting, like culturally, the way that we act as humans and what we think. The Hawaiian pizza is not Hawaii's version of pizza. It's the perception of Hawaii that these suburban places have. Fascinating insight. Also above a minute. Another minus five points. But I'm going to let all that pass. I think that was great answers for all eight of them. So I'm going to give you eight out of eight points. Let's see if you can keep the momentum going for the next game when we do end up playing it. But while we're on the topic of the link between pizza and cultural influences, it's, I want to share a story with you. So for the first 18 years of my life, the only pizza that I knew was Pizza Hut. I grew up in this middle-class Indian immigrant family in the Middle East. And whenever we ate outside, it was always at these budget Indian restaurants. Never ate pizza outside. My parents did not grow up eating pizza. They grew up in India in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. There was no pizza there. So I think my dad had a pizza for the first time in his late 20s when he came to the US on a business trip. And the whole idea was we've heard so much about pizza. Let's just try it. But he never really developed the taste buds for it. So... When we were growing up, we never ended up going to eat pizza outside. My only exposure to pizza was at kids' birthday parties where there's Pizza Hut always there. And these frozen pizza you used to get at supermarkets, these really hard bases with like a layer of cheese that the moment you bite it, rips the cheese off completely. When we ended up going to Italy, I think it was, I was in my grade 11, and it was the entire family. There's a whole group that went across this, uh, this Europe tour that happens. One of the things on the agenda is try out a Neapolitan pizza because we've always heard that this is the origin story for pizza. Pizza is not really pizza. So we were like, this is it. We're going to try it out. It's going to be amazing. Collectively, it was a group of 40 people. The moment we had a Neapolitan pizza, the reaction was, um, what's this? So no hate to people from Naples. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of hate coming through. But our, I think I remember the reaction was, where's the thick crust? Where's the lots of cheese? Where are the olives? It was so different from this idea of pizza that we had in our mind for at least the last 18, 19, 20 years. I've been just eating that. And I think it didn't sit well with everyone. And the idea was, let's just say, like, we like our version better. Over the years now, I think I've developed an acquired taste for Neapolitan pizza and other styles as well. But I do think it's, I still have a soft spot for the fast food version of pizza, which is Pizza Hut, Domino's, Papa John's, Papa Murphy's, used by uh, talking about that as well. And I feel like in a moment of weakness, that will still be my idea of comfort food. So the question that arises from this is, 
how do you view these fast food chains are you happy that they're providing this effective cheap easily scalable gateway for developing countries to discover pizza and to i mean in a way it's making it a lot more accessible for them or are you frustrated that they because they're so easily scalable so effective so cheap they're corrupting the idea of what pizza really means for these kids who will eat it for the first time will grow up eating it while i don't like the food that most of them make i don't think that's why they're there i think they exist for exactly the reason you said and why i think that the chains are great is that they do spread it in a way that's affordable and as a gateway to use your term so i have very favorable attitude about chain pizza the only issue i have is exactly what you experienced is that it creates a definition for the food which is not the full picture and as long as we think of pizza as being one food one recipe that's when we're going to get into trouble that's when our expectations will not be met by traveling to a new place but once we think of it as a format that's its highlight its benefit is that it changes and adapts to its locale that's when i think we'll be fine so the first time you went to naples and ate a pizza your expectation was it's going to be a better version of what i grew up with and the reality was oh it's totally different so it creates this identity crisis <laughs> am i not eating pizza or is this not pizza or is this really just worse or and as a you were in grade 11 grade 11 okay so 16 years old something like that that's a formative time as a teenager figuring out who you are figuring out what is pizza first time i went to italy was the same age and i had pizza in florence and i had thought the same uh, what's the big deal new jersey's got better pizza than this because i thought of the word pizza as meaning one thing so if you grow up thinking that this is pizza then it means that these aren't all pizza but these are legos and this is just one type of lego and that's the better more correct attitude yeah i resonate with this identity crisis it was it went all spiraling down for me from that day itself it's only been down there since then <laughs> but to as a follow up question to this i do take a point about not trying to box it in not trying to try to put things into categories pizza is just like a format or is like a large umbrella term for so many different styles do you think that's what we should do because i feel when it comes to something like taco bell there's a clear distinction that this is not really taco but it's its own thing but when it comes to domino's or pizza Hut, we don't really regard it as a separate style of pizza it's still regarded as pizza and this is often an argument i get into with a lot of friends from europe as well but they say the new york style pizza is not really pizza this is a, the italian style is the authentic style and i just say treat new york style as its own thing like a dish of its own maybe it's got the label of pizza but it's just an experience that you need to have and don't try to compare it with the others do you think we should have the same perspective for pizza and dominos and i say this because you you said you have a favorable attitude for dominos there's a lot of benefit they provided along with being a gateway also in terms of technology dominos was the first you mentioned in your book to develop the corrugated pizza box which has made pizza delivery much easier for a lot of people so i do see them in a positive way but do you think we need to change the perspective slightly it's hard because you can't actively change a perspective we can't sit here and do that but I do think that the way that we approach the way that we set our expectations about a food has everything to do with how much we enjoy that food. So while I like the idea of creating definitions, I like the idea of putting these styles into a box. So this way you understand what something's trying to achieve. So if you say this is New York style pizza that's your version of well think of New York style as a different type of as its own thing New York style pizza is one thing Neapolitan pizza is this it doesn't mean that these are the only options it just means that the if you fit into these parameters then it's you can define it as one thing I like keeping definitions I would like every pizza margarita in the world to be the same ingredient or the same basic ingredients I don't like going to a place and seeing that their pizza margarita has red onions on it because it's not a pizza margarita it's something else it makes it difficult for the user. So I like those definitions but I think it's very it's very important to understand the different style nature and the fact that Neapolitan 
should set different expectations. That's why on a tour, my whole goal is to have people eat the food. And then they say, oh, this is a lot crunchier. And then we say, well, this is the oven. This is the pan. This is how it bakes. Now you understand why it's crunchier. Now you'll have be better prepared for your next experience in pizza, being able to set your expectations appropriately. So to hopefully answer your question, it has to do with setting expectations appropriately. And if we think of a food as one thing, it can't be anything different, then that's limiting to that food. And the whole reason that we're sitting at this table talking about pizza today is because of the chains spreading pizza globally and the fact that pizza has been allowed to change. If it's a, and you used a magic word, you said an authentic pizza in Naples. And that word is so loaded. It, Authenticity refers to a time and a place. It doesn't mean that this is the real and everything else is the fake. So an authentic New York style pizza from what time and place? Neapolitan pizza today is probably not the same as a Neapolitan pizza from 250 years ago. That's where this whole argument over what's real and what's fake, what's authentic, what's not, what's traditional, what's a violation is flawed from the start it's a yeah it's a very very interesting take you're right we can't change the perspective but i think the more conversation we have around pizza styles and how i'm not boxing it in, i'm sure we will start the revolution from this episode it's have this is a, this is a moment in history um I it's hope gonna you, happen there's yeah. no way to stop it not now <laughs> not now i want to stick with the theme of sentimental attachment and nostalgia i shared a story about growing up at pizza hut when people have asked you what is one of your first memories with pizza, you shared two memories that always stand out. The first is sitting shotgun in your mom's car, holding a bunch of boxes and squeezing them together and getting that whiff. You can can you still smell it? Yeah, I can. Yeah. What oregano. A great, it's oregano. Something about smell, right? Just always triggers some mm -hmm. great memories. And the second memory you've shared is getting out of school early on half days on Friday, going to Calabria Pizza at Cranford, New Jersey. Yes. Getting a slice, oh, respect to the OG, right? Getting a slice, getting a Coke and getting a bouncy ball. My question for you is now over 20 years later, you, your entire life and career revolves around pizza. Can you fall prey to the trap of ruining what was once a positive experience for you? Have you, and this is often a risk that comes across when people try to convert what they're passionate about into work. Have you ever come across a moment where you just stopped yourself from saying, oh, I see what they've done with the dough, the rice or not, whole skim or semi skim mozzarella, is it greasy or not, char at the bottom. Have you just stopped yourself and said, no matter how the pizza's made, let me just enjoy it first? Yeah. Oh my goodness. When, when I first started doing this, I remember my friend Mike said to me, Oh, are you going to start hating pizza because you're going to make it your job? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the answer is it hasn't happened because I do exactly what you just said. And I think I probably hopefully do it on every tour is because I don't eat a slice on every tour, but there are some times when we're at a place that I don't go to very often. And I've been thinking about it all day and <laughs> the, the weather's perfect and we're sitting on the back patio and I get a slice and a root beer and I, and I sit down maybe with the tour guests, whatever. And I just, and people will be asking me questions. And, you know, on a tour, and there's 32 people on a bus tour on a Sunday, they're asking questions constantly, and it's my job to answer all of them. But when I'm eating a slice of pizza, I have no problem saying to them, excuse me, I'm going to eat this slice. Because they know that, they know I'm not being rude. They know that I'm really having my moment. Yeah. But then they respect it. Because they know by that point, they, they know I'm giving them the information. I'm not holding off. It's not that I don't want to help them. It's that... This is the time to have the slice. And it's my way of reminding myself to don't take yourself so seriously. Sure, the, the, all this history stuff is really kind of heavy stuff and the way that it's more digestible is because it's pizza. But by, by taking that second to sit back and eat it, that's what, that's what it's all about. And also over the years, I feel like every year or two, I stop and I consider, oh, I'm gonna change what I wear during tours and I'm gonna wear like long pants and maybe I'll wear a little jacket or something and like, you know, be a little bit more like historian, like more respectable. <laughs> and yeah, and says, yeah. I ha yeah, yeah, like a monocle. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I'm always like, no, it's hot out. I want to wear, I wear yeah. shorts and a t-shirt and it doesn't matter how old I am. I'm dressed like a teenage kid, you know, 
because that reminds me of what I'm there for. And I think it's an easier information to take in when it's not being told to you by a lecturer, when it's being told to you by someone who's your peer. This constantly shines through this. You have this ability to just break that barrier between like, and you've spoken about this in previous interviews is whether you don't want to come across as a pizza guru or a pizza expert. You're just someone who's passionate about pizza, just sharing the information. And I think that also helps because then it's just like, this, there's this collective feeling of we just out here to discover pizza, just know its story. And then everyone's on board with that idea. I, I just really love it. But while we're on the topic of taking a moment to love pizza and not trying to hate it, you've also worked behind the counter. So you worked as a slice slinger at New York Suprema. You worked as a pizza maker in Las Vegas. And you've also worked undercover at Domino's. So do you think working behind the counter your love for pizza was that serious threat or that ended up deepening your love for it even further? That deepened my love for it. And the reason I, I did that as a project so that in talking to people about pizza, when I first started, I never made pizza at home. I always figured that that was sort of a different territory that I didn't want to get into. And I had never worked at a pizzeria. And then I started to realize the limitations of that. So let me step behind the counter because the more I have that experience, the better I'll be at explaining. And it was so important to me from the beginning to be able to say, oh, well, I've touched the document that shows you what year they built this oven. I've been in the fields where they harvest the tomatoes. I've pet the water buffalo in uh, Pestum. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all that's very important to me. And I don't have, every tour, I don't have to sit there and give my credit, my credentials about what animal I pet once. <laughs> Uh, it's, but when you're hearing somebody talk about something is a very clear difference between somebody who's read it on the internet and then somebody who's really done the work to experience it. So when you mentioned New Haven a few minutes ago, we always get questions about New Haven. We're very close to New Haven physically. And also the, the spirit of our pizzas has a huge connection. And so I'm taking all my tour guides to New Haven because some have not ever been there and I want them all to understand it, not from reading about it in a book or in a essay that I write for them. I want them all to feel the walls of the oven and to eat the food. And personal experience comes through the words and it comes through the soul in a way that just talking about something as written history doesn't work. Personal experience does come through the soul. I completely agree with you. We've been talking about enjoying a pizza slice. You've mentioned in a previous interview, there are certain traits you look for in a good, enjoyable slice. I've got them listed here. So you look for a flexible base, slightly flexible, good balance between tomato and cheese. You slightly lean towards the tomato. Some people, a little bit of an edge, char on the bottom. And sometimes you like a counterpoint between the sweetness and the char, like a hot honey, for example. Did I miss anything? No, I mean, for a New York slice, that's, that's what I'm into. That's, that's what you're into. So now that we have the recipe for a good, enjoyable slice, I'm going to flip the script, turn the tables. I'm going to ask you to dissect another New York icon, the bagel. What do you look for in a good bagel? Well, in my mind, a good bagel, really, that just means a properly made bagel. And in my mind, the good bagel is a First of all, it's warm right out of the oven. You got to eat it within the first few hours. And it's crisp exterior that gives way to a dense and chewy interior. And that when you break open that bagel, there has to be a fragrance of a sweet, malty, nutty fragrance of the dough itself. If the bagel doesn't taste like a good bread, if it doesn't have its own flavor that's different from standard bread, if it's just fluffy with a hole in it, not a bagel. A bagel has to be dense because that reflects that it was made properly. It boils first so that the exterior gelatinizes before the interior is able to open. If you were to bake it without boiling, you just get a big puffy bread. Boiling it, then baking it, I mean, I think of it. Crack on the outside of it. Perfect. Do you toast your bagel or do you do them fresh? I get it toasted. You do. What does that tell you about me? <laughs> um, it tells me that I wonder, well, did you go to Absolute Bagel? Loved it. Okay, yeah. yeah. And you got that toasted? Yes. 
Have you ever had a fresh one? Is that a one, crime? Yeah? No. Um, actually, here's the story. Do you want to, is this story time? I wasn't planning on telling this. Uh, this was the story that's close to my heart. So first time I, first day in New York, first morning. And I was like, I have to get either a pizza slice or a bagel. Has My first day in New York has to be one of the two. Absolute Bagels is next to where I stay. Line around the block. I'm standing in the line. And I'm like, I'm in, I'm in New York now. I should, like, this is the city that entertains conversations. I'm not going to Google what the best bagel is. I tap the lady in front of me. I'm like, it's just my first day here. Can you tell me which is the best bagel? And she starts talking to me. She's like, where you come from? I said, Dubai. We get into a conversation. And uh, she tells me, oh, she loves the everything bagel, butter and toasted with the garlic cream cheese. And I'm like, that's exactly what I'm getting. It turns out she was... So this is what happens. She asked me what I did. We had this whole conversation. I asked her, what do you do? She's like, I'm a personal assistant to an actor. I was like, is this New York? What's happening? This is first day in New York, the person in front of me is a personal assistant to an actor. And ends up she is, she's ended up meeting George Clooney, Brad Pitt. And she starts saying all stories about this. Like, what is happening over here? But she got me. And then when we got to the counter, she said, the bagel's on me. Because welcome to New York. And it just feels right. And she bought me my bagel. And it was an everything bagel. Bought and toasted cream cheese i had a moment and i have this one bagel in me that i'm now going to pass it on to this one person who comes to me is like first day in new york i want to try a bagel and that day i'll buy them a bagel and the circle of bagels is going to continue going on but that's how i got into toasted bagels long story short i love that and it's so like you know like p- people listening to this or watching it uh, don't think that that kind of thing is real but that is exactly how the city works. And uh, so that's such a quintessential experience. And of course that person said like, oh, I got your bagel. Don't worry about it. The actor paid for it. But I digress. So yeah, I get it toasted. So yeah. which doesn't make you a bad person. <laughs> but uh, but it's just a very different thing. And like I used, I used to think that no, fresh is the only thing. By toasting it, you're destroying the beauty of a fresh bagel. But toasting it is physically different. You're changing. You're getting way more crunch. If what you're looking for is that crisp crunch, then that's what you get. I like a soft inside, a chewy inside. But I personally prefer fresh. When I go to Absolute Bagel, I always just ask for what was the last one that came out of the oven. So whatever's the warmest just came out of the oven, that's what I'll get. I just, But also, I like to kind of play it as it rolls. So in a pizzeria, if I look in the window and see one pizza just came out, it's full, no slices cut yet, kind of steamy, then I'll get that. Just that's, you know, the the city has told me what to get. Right. It's a sign from the universe. It that's, is. That's what's in your day to day. That's the slice. You don't go with the preconceived notion about it. Love it. One of the questions you hate the most is what is your favorite pizza? So my next question, what's your favorite bagel? That's not going to be the question, but you have described that. In order to really understand New York pizza, you need to create a past, present, future stratification. And in the pizza world, you've put in the past, you put Totonos and John's. In the present, you've put slice shops like Joe's and Luigi's. And in the new, you've put in the present, future, you've put Roberta's, Mama's to Nucali. Can you create the same past, present, future stratification for bagels? Probably not because I don't eat a lot of bagels because I eat a lot of pizza. And bagels are very dense, bready. And I know if I eat a bagel, that's a lot of bread intake. And I bake bread at home, so I have to be careful. But I will say this, Absolute Bagel is, and I don't even know how old it is, but that for me feels like a past. And the present and future to me are going to, I'm going to combine them. I love Baz Bagel. That's a very present place, but they make a very classic bagel. And then Future of Bagels I keep seeing places that are doing these funky things with bagels. Um, Rainbow, blueberry. Yeah, all that, which is, I don't see that as the future, but it's more like the future of bagels. I'm not going to name a place, but I'm going to say beyond New York is my answer because I had a very good bagel in Berkeley, California last week. And people always, they say this over and over again, Oh, the pizza in New York and the bagels in New York are just better because of the water. And it is 100% false. And the only evidence I need is that I had a bagel in Berkeley, California that I very could have easily could have eaten in New York. And it's, they're not bringing in the water. 
not the water. This is the same argument they make with the pizza as well. And you've mentioned that even the bad pizza areas are using the same water. So it's clearly not just the water. I love that you included absolute bagels in it. It's got a soft spot in my heart, not just because of the story I mentioned, but ever since I moved down from Upper West Side, I've changed teams. I've now gone to Liberty Bagels. Don't tell Absolute Bagels. I've never been. You have to go. Okay. Have yeah. you ever been in Utopia Bagels? I have not, but it's not in Manhattan. No, right? it's in Queens. Yeah, that's right. But I really so, want to go. I've I've seen a TikTok video about it. And ever mm. since then, it's been on my list. Utopia Bagels. I gotta go. Yeah, they're getting me. That's how they get me. This TikTok that's, is... Hey, look, as long as, it, <laughs> as long as it delivers the good, the goods, I'm there. Sounds like a plan. Time for our next game. This is another rapid fire round. I know you don't stick to the time limit, but this is going to be a minute or less again. I'll try. This is, <laughs> don't worry if you go overboard. You'll only miss out on the trophy. So this is a game of absurd questions. I'm just going to ask you questions about some absurd things you've eaten or seen or done in your life. I would love to hear your, your take. Are you ready? Yes. Let's go. So first one, you're notorious for bringing an infrared thermometer into pizza shops and measuring the temperature of the pizza slice. In the wise words of Scott Wiener, if it's about 170, it's going to burn your mouth. What's the hottest pizza slice you've ever had? 225 at Patsy's in East Harlem. Did it end up burning you? Well, I waited. You waited. There we go. But are they notoriously the, like the hottest slice? That ever Not comes notoriously, out? but low moisture mozzarella will hold down a heat longer than fresh mozzarella. A longer bake usually holds down a more heat. But that's when that pie comes right out of the oven, it's crazy. 225. That's crazy. Next one. You've often found absurd toppings like banana, chocolate, pineapple, absurd but good. What is one absurd but terrible topping on a pizza? Absurd and terrible? I've never found a topping that was 100% of the time terrible on pizza. And it's because I think people incorrectly assume that a pizza has to be built with tomato sauce, then cheese, and then topping. But if you start with the absurd topping, you can design a pizza around it and it will de-absurdify it. But everything's legal. Everything's legal. Everything. Drop one on me. What's weird? Let's, well, I'll tie this in the next one because you often have this debate with Mark from Lucali on Really Dope about what really is a pizza. It's a ship of thesis argument, right? Is a ramen pizza a pizza? Is a pizza with a popcorn base and first we face? Is that a pizza? And you said... Nothing's absurd. <laughs> Nothing. Everything counts. Everything is legal. Let's start with another absurd question. What is one popular mainstream pizza style out there that you think is not really pizza? You've already thrown Chicago deep dish under the bus. No, Chicago deep Sorry, dish the, is pizza. Detroit. Sorry, you've already thrown. No, this. Detroit is really pizza. I'm just saying that it's <laughs> it doesn't exist on its own. It 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 stands on the shoulders of those who came before. The giants it. of Fukashi. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. So and what it, is the most absurd pizza style that's not really a pizza? I, they're all pizza. I, I, people confuse with, just because it's pizza doesn't mean it tastes good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Like, I, like I've had St. Louis style pizza is thin. Yeah. I think it's yeastless dough with Provel cheese on top. Provel. I shouldn't even call it a cheese. I don't like that. <laughs> but it's pizza. So uh, it's funny. Sometimes people, I'll, tell, I'll say to somebody, well, like there was a really dope episode and I don't know if I said this on it, but a pizza bagel isn't a pizza. Is it a bagel? It's a bagel. It's a bagel. Okay. Yeah. Just because it's dressed like a pizza doesn't make it a pizza. It's a bagel. But some people will hear me say that and then they'll say, but they're so good. And I'll have to, yeah, but good and pizza don't. Just because it's pizza doesn't mean it's good. Where are you drawing the Ice line? Ice cream's good. Like, where are you drawing the line? Like, is that popcorn base? Is that the a pizza? The line is always changing. Yeah. Well, but that was, that was when Nicole Russell made that on First We Feast. And it was delicious. I wasn't there to say whether or not it was pizza. <laughs> I was there to say whether it was good. And it was so good. And I was shocked because I thought oh, it was going to be a nightmare. But it was great because she's the best. But I think that the line is always changing. I think that the definition of pizza is expanding constantly, just like the universe. And every time we think we have a definition, there's a thing that's just beyond. 10 years later, that's normal. And then there's another thing. Pickles on pizza. Now everybody's doing it. Of course it's pizza. Why wouldn't it be? By adding something on top of a pizza, you don't take away its identity. You only add to it. So people love to argue. 
I think it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Next question. Most absurd pizza saver, pizza table design that you've seen? I've seen the one that just looks like a flux capacitor. It's really? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, right. boop, boop, boop. it just didn't seem structurally sound. Was it actually saving the pizza? I don't know. Cause I very rarely interact with them cause I don't get pizza delivered ever. Right. And I almost never eat pizza out of a box. So that is kind of like a throwaway. Have you come across, this is the next question. Have you come across people who actually used to collect it? And have you seen a use for those pizza tables? Cause I had a fledgling collection when I was young. Did you really? And my mom threw it. Thanks mom. Oh um, yeah. How sad. I, I come, the tables, the cute tables, yeah, right? Yeah. I've come across people who collected them like kids on tours and I've given them, if you turn it upside down and clip off one of the legs, you can use it as a smartphone stand. Damn. That's the only use I've seen that I think is worth anything. About it. I've seen somebody on probably TikTok use it to separate two slices, but then it rips yeah. the slices apart. So it's that's that's where people are starved for content to make, and they come up with something like that that's useless. And now I have to watch twenty five copycats. It's very fresh. I love that phone stand idea. See, people getting so much fact and so many useful hacks for life out of this interview. You thought this is just going to be a hangout interview, but no. Yeah, look at that. All look deeper. Look deeper. <laughs> Always look deeper. In your book, We Will Our Pizza, you describe many different pizza box shapes. What is the most absurd pizza box shape you've come across? The octagon. The octagon. Why? There's no reason. <laughs> Every time you have an angle, it means you have to have some part of the box full. So when you have a square box, there's one fold over. An octagon has eight foldovers, and that's a waste of time. So the octagon box, bizarre. You mostly find it in Brazil. Brazil. Interesting choice. I'm speaking to the person who holds the title for the Guinness World Record for the most unique pizza box collection. What is the most absurd art that you've seen on the pizza box? I've seen this. I think it was from Finland. This demonic... It felt like 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 the pizzeria was owned by a cult and it had these markings on it, like a pentagram, but like something beyond a pentagram. I don't even know about Damn. it. Damn. Yeah. And then it had this, it was printed with black ink. I, it's an incredible box. I'll show you a picture of it later. And there's this like cat and like, like on this woman's back, it's just very weird, but no name of a pizzeria. It was just like this weird piece of dark art on the pizza box. Incredible. That's why I collect pizza boxes. You know, if it was me, I would push it even further. It's like the Lil Nas had this collaboration with Nike where they got like this yeah. uh, satanic shoes and they had put like the pentagram on it and they had real blood in the soul. I would push it even further. Why Whose not? Whose blood was in it? I didn't ask those questions. But yeah, that's a good one. I think we should get on it. Final question. And this is interestingly tied to what you just mentioned. And I'm happy to negate all those minus points that you got. If this, if this answer matches it, what is one ghost story concerning pizzas you've come across? If not, then what is the most absurd story concerning pizzas that you've come across? They say that the John's Pizzeria in Times Square. Don't spoil it for me, please. The old gospel <laughs> tabernacle church, which was once an orphanage. They say that it's still haunted by former tenants. Is it actually? That's what they say. I mean, I don't know if it's actually, that's a question for a higher level. Have there been sightings? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, this, I'm not making this up. Damn. Yeah. Cause I've always, I love ghost stories and ghost tours. I've always wanted to do a Halloween ghost pizza tour. Right. But there's just not enough pizzerias that have stories, but that's, that's a serious one. The original location of Lombardi's was formerly a police station and they say that there was a like the 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 jails were underneath the building and that's just creepy to me you know to put people downstairs no light no anything and it's just creepy no ghost story but creepy i'll keep an eye out in case you find something at the old location for Lombard. at the old location mm -hmm. and when you stand outside there's a little grate in the sidewalk and when you look down one of the former managers told me like, oh yeah, that was the old jail. And I was like, I don't think so. Yeah. It's not, and but then, that's what he said. And then you looked down. And there was a face. Oh, there we go. Stop. Yeah. Not even surprised. And it was midnight. Gets even worse. I need to see this Halloween ghost tour, but that brings an end to the second game. I say aced it. And in a minute or less as well, 
perfect performance. You're going to get a trophy. And I think you can add these accolades to your growing resume of accomplishments. Oh. This is the biggest one yet. Extremely, extremely proud of you. Before we move into our final questions, I'd love for you to interpret what you've built with the Lego here. What do you think this is? I don't know what this is, but I've been experimenting with the idea of disconnected art. So I have none of the Legos, which Legos are meant to be interlocking. And I've kind of made my one rule to have none of them touch. This is the first time someone's built something that doesn't touch. I, I just feel like I, I like to experiment by doing, let's see the opposite of what this thing is for. And I love building with blocks and going up and everything, but I want to see, well, if I don't make them touch, what's going to happen? I don't know. Letting it flow. Do you have an interpretation of this? I'm trying. Yeah, I don't know. A circuit board? Not sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it you be. know, it's like a Rorschach test. It really says more about <laughs> you than a me. Exactly. Well, engineer reflects. Yeah. Yeah, drips all the way through, right? The first thing I saw is a circuit board. And then people in the comments are like, oh, God, so dumb. Can't you see it's like a city or something? Of yeah, that it's a seahorse. It's a seahorse. But I love this contactless art that you've created on the show. It's, uh, in, it's, part just, of what I'm I like. I'm learning so much. So, I am too. <laughs> I've never done this. But, I, I, you know, I as a kid, I used to play with things like this. And once you build something, I, I didn't want to take it down. So I, there are still things in my parents' house that I built when I was 10 years old that are because I never wanted to take them apart. And with this, you, you have no choice. It's already taken apart. So I like this going for this. 4D chess. This is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not permanent. Like you can wipe this away and it's okay. Because it wasn't, I can't save it. I'm not going to break it. I'm going to auction this straight off of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you just sign, just leave a signature there? Perfect. Great performance and Lego as well. Let's move into final questions. What are some books, movies, or role models that have strongly influenced in your life? Well, it's funny when you reference Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That scene alone with Jeff Spicoli it resonates so deeply about what pizza is. And are, are you asking specifically about pizza? In general. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So a book that's really resonated with me is this book by Lynn Truss called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. Have you heard this? Nope. It's a book about grammar. And the title Eats, Shoots, and Leaves has a different meaning depending on whether or not you have commas or where you have the commas. And, you know, it's, and I just, I read that book and it just kind of opened my eyes to the idea of, and the importance of communication and the difference in meaning between one way of saying thing and another. And so on a tour, I've tried to find the best, clearest ways to communicate concepts. And that book really did a lot for me. That was cool. Movies, role models? M movies. I'm not a big, my brothers Apart are from Fast Times, movie people. But yeah. like, no, but there are other movies that I think are really interesting. Uh, but I'm, okay. So my top movies of all time. Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Mm -hmm. And because it's this alternate reality of a movie where the main character lives in this reality and everyone around him is relatively normal. And I just love that idea of this existence and how he has this house and this whole existence and this bicycle that's so specific. And then you, there's no such thing as a plot hole in that movie because there's, it's, it's in this bizarre reality. So I love that. Ghostbusters, one of the ultimate New York City movies of all time. So funny, so perfect. There's not a, bit of fat in that movie i love that and uh yeah that's it for my movies oh raiders of the lost ark i just really love that as a movie kind of problematic looking back at it now <laughs> but but like you know as a kid it was like just this like adventure and that's all it is it was kind of fun but Wee's big adventure the best what would you like your legacy to be like my legacy well in doing these tours, I've my, my older brother Dan is a teacher, and I he sort of identified some things about what I do in tours from the from the perspective of being a teacher. And the legacy of any person who's an educator is, of course, 
how much that information sticks to the student. And so the whole idea of this tour is, is that people will take that information, not just the information of how much fun they had on a pizza tour and telling all their neighbors to take one, but more about understanding the depth and the respect for the food and the people behind the food and the stories behind the people. And that that filters out and that people start to see that things that appear simple have a lot more complexity that just because of a simple appearance doesn't mean it should be disregarded. So if there's any legacy about what I do, it should be that, that those concepts spread. Yeah, I already think you're building the legacy. In fact, I mentioned the starting of the interview as well. It's just all your work, I'm able to retain a lot more. You have this amazing way of presenting information. And I think the history teachers in school should adopt your method. And instead of teaching about World War One or World War II, talk about pizza and try to sneak in those facts there. I think the students might be a lot more interesting. You know what? It's funny because I didn't retain a lot from history classes in school. So I was not a history buff. And I got into it when I saw it in practice in the same way that I'm not a math person. But when I make pizza dough, math is crucial. And I become a math for pizza dough person. So yeah, it, if, especially students, high school kids, if you can't see it in practice, then you know what's the classic question from any student who's bored, when am I going to need this in my real life? And if you teach people from a different direction, then it's kind of obvious. Like talking about pizza, they don't realize that they're learning algebra via pizza dough or history and economics via pizza stuff. If you don't realize you're learning, that's like the best way to learn. Best way to learn. I agree. Also want to touch upon this. What would you like the legacy of Slice Out Hunger to be by the end of your run? I want Slice Out Hunger to be a real centerpiece for pizzerias around the country to be able to feel unity with other pizzerias that have the same goal without being part of a franchise or a chain. And that's the biggest piece. We're in the beginning of that right now. We have 635 members. We're going to have a thousand members soon enough, and that'll be 10,000 members soon enough. And it's, it's all a way for pizzerias to feel like they're more connected while helping their communities. And it's also a way for the public to realize that this is more than just a place to get food, that I want people to feel the way that I feel about pizzerias in New York, which is that they're a place where you feel connected to the pizzeria more than just the food. And when you see that your local pizzeria is doing something to help the community beyond just sponsoring a baseball team, but when they're feeding people in need in the community who can't afford to pay for it, to me, that's just like so much more of a civil way to operate a business. And it's tough because, of course, the economy is like a roller coaster. But if we build into the basis of what we do, that this is, we always want to be a member of our community and not just uh, trying to sell things to people. It's just a better way to exist in the world of capitalism. I agree. And it's a great initiative and I encourage a lot of people to check it out. Final question for you. We, through the course of this interview, you spoke about how pizza has a connection to the history of the place itself, connection to the culture of the place. Through uh, stories about nostalgia and sentiment attachment, we explored what pizza tells us about ourselves. Final question for you is, what is the meaning of this all? What do you think is the meaning of life? It's a weird phrasing of a question that we've all asked ourselves a million times, you know, meaning of life. And I choose to think about it more like the purpose of life, which I think is to is to make the lives of everything that comes after you better. So you can think about it as uh as a present tense thing, but we know that we're all temporary. And I, we all know that we won't know what comes next. I mean, not, not for us, but for people who are around after we're not. And so I think the purpose is to leave something that hopefully has a ripple and lifts the waters for everybody else. Hopefully create a ripple and lift the waters for everyone else. It's a great meaning to have. Scott, thank you so much. If people want to connect with you, find out what you're up to next, get, uh, get connected, get volunteering with Slice Out Hunger, where can they do so? Yeah, they can go to sliceouthunger.org or Instagram at sliceouthunger. 
or scottspizzatours.com or Instagram at scottspizzatours. Definitely recommend to check it out. Scott, thank you so much. It was a privilege talking to you. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.